Hello, everyone, and Chagat Smot Sameach, a wonderful uh, celebration of 73 years of the State of Israel. And uh, obviously, we thank God each and every day, but especially today for that blessing, that beracha that we have. And we'll talk about the kingdom of David today. But uh, interesting, though, and I, I did see this, that uh, if you think about the length of the state of Israel, which is 73 years now, that's more than the kingdom of David over the entire state, over all of Israel, and Solomon. Solomon ruled for 40 years, and David over all Israel for 33 years. So state of Israel, bigger than David and Shalomah. So uh, not necessarily as big in, uh, in, in Kedusha with the Beit HaMikdash, but certainly... Uh, a very high level. So we're going to talk about today is the desire of David to build the Beit HaMikdash, the response of Hashem. We're going to analyze why David was told not now, and then David's response to being told not now, the berachot that he received and his response to all the good tidings that Hashem gives him. So we're going to begin. Pasuk Aleph. It came to pass, and interesting here, and we've talked about this many times in scripture, Vayhi always introduces something sad, something bad. And the sad thing which we're going to read here is that David's desire to build the Beit HaMikdash, he doesn't, it doesn't happen in his lifetime. That's the, what that Vayhi is hinting at. Anyway, and it was, Ki yashav when the king was sitting in his house, in his palace. And God had given him rest round about from all his enemies. And that's an important phrase there. He was feeling secure. And the king said to Natan the prophet, he said, look, I'm sitting in a house of cedars. And guess what? The Ark of God is sitting within curtains. And Natan said to the king, All that is in your heart, go and do, for Hashem is with you. Now, we have a number of questions going on about this which is, why now did David think it's time to build the Beit HaMikdash? So if we go back to Sefer Devarim, and we read the description of when it's appropriate though to build the Beit HaMikdash, it says, you'll cross the Jordan, or have done that, and you'll dwell in the land, or we've done that, which uh, the Lord your God is giving to you as an inheritance. And you will have rest from all your enemies round about you. And you will dwell securely. Now, what did it say up here in Pasuk Aleph? Hashem had given him rest round about him from all his enemies. So David is feeling that now is the time to build the Beit HaMikdash. However, there's one phrase missing there. Vishavtem betach, and you will dwell securely. David felt he was dwelling securely. But perhaps, as we'll see in the commentaries, HaKadosh Baruch Hu did not agree. As Rashi says to Shemuel on this pasuk, David remarked, Behold, it has been fulfilled, and when he offers you rest on all your enemies, what is written afterwards? Then there shall be a place which Hashem shall choose. In the very next pasuk, in Devarim Perikud Bet Pasuk Yudid, the next pasuk Yud Aleph says, Then you will build the Beit HaMikdash, in the place which Hashem will choose. Therefore, he said to himself, it's incumbent upon me to build the Beit HaMikdash. Okay? 
So we understand what David decided, what he thought about, makes perfect sense. I've got peace. Now's the time to build the Beit HaMikdash. Okay? I'm doing great. Now's the time to acknowledge HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Now it's interesting here that in Gimel it says, Natan said to the king, all that is in your heart to do, all that is in your heart, go and do, because Hashem is with you. Meaning that Natan said, and normally we talk about Natan as Natan HaNavi, here he's just called plain Natan. Why? Because Natan didn't have Nivua when he said this. He assumed, and be careful of what assumptions do to us, but he made an assumption that David is also has Ruach HaKodesh, he also has divine, uh, d- divine prophecy. And so therefore, perhaps what, has, what he's suggesting him to do is the, uh, that he wants to, uh, what David wants to do is not just his own will, but it's the will of God. But we'll see that Natan was wrong. Rob is putting there in the notes that Shabbat, or shin vet tav, is a Hebrew word for dwelling, resting, dwelling. Yeah, you could absolutely say that. That's a good point. I am shav, so it should be that it's time for Hashem to shev with us, to dwell with us. Very good. In Pasuk Dalad, it says here, vahi balayla hahu, at that very night, vahi deva Hashem el natan lemo, Behold, the word of God came to Natan saying, Lech, go, va'amarta el avdi el David, go and say to my servant to David, Ko ama Hashem, so says Hashem, ha'ata tivne li vayit l'shivti, will you build for me a house to dwell? For me to dwell, for my dwelling? Does that make sense, that you should build a, a house for me to dwell? I've not dwelt in a house from the day which I came up with B'nai Yisrael from Mitzrayim until this very day. But I've walked in a tent and in a tabernacle. In all the places where I have walked with all the children of Israel, did I speak a word with any of the rulers of Israel, whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why do you not build for me a house of cedar? And now, so shall you say to my servant, to David, thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the sheep coat, from following the sheep, to be a leader over my people Israel. Tet, ve'ye imcha bechol halachta, and I have been with you wherever you have gone. And I have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I've made for you a great name, like the name of the great ones that are on the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people, for Israel, and I will plant them, and they will dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And the wicked people shall not continue to afflict them as they did before. And even from the day that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies, and the Lord has told you that the Lord will make you, will make for you a house. For when your days are filled, 
and you shall lie with your forefathers. And I have established your seed after you. That shall proceed from your body after you. And I will establish his kingdom. Who you've never bought this me? He will build a house in my name. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father. And he shall be to me as a son. And when he goes astray, I will chasten him with a rod of men and with the stripes of the son of Adam. But my mercy shall not depart from him as I withdrew it from Shaul, whom I removed from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be confirmed forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. According to all these words and according to all this vision, so did Natan speak to David. Now, my friends, it's time to jump into the Psukim. It's time to understand what exactly is, is wrong with David's request to build the Beit HaMikdash. And at the same time, that David is rejected from building the Beit HaMikdash. Hashem is so kind to him and gives him so many berachot. We have to understand all of this. So the first thing we're going to look at is, why does it say that very night that David, the, 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 the prophecy came to Natan, that David would not build the Beit HaMikdash? Says Rashi, quoting the Midrash, Rabbi Hanina Bar Papa Amar, Rabbi Hanina Bar Papa said, HaKadosh Baruch Hu Amal Natan, God said to Natan, this man that I'm sending you to is hasty. Perhaps he will hire workers and I will find myself incurring him a financial loss. Hurry and tell him it is not you who will build the house. You know what? Don't delay. If I wait even a second, David's already going to hire all the workers. He's going to have to lose all that money. Rabbi Shimon has a different answer. This man that I am sending you to is wont to make vows, just as it is stated, how he swore to the Lord and vowed to the mighty one of Jacob, if I will enter the tent which is in my house. Perhaps you will say, I will not eat, nor will I drink until I build the temple, and I will find myself incurring him a loss. I cannot do that, either financial loss or a physical loss. He's going to be starving. Therefore, do it straight away. Don't hold back from him. Now, why was David not allowed to build the Beit HaMikdash? Number of interpretations. And the first one, which I want to give to you, is Pshutosha Mikra. And this is important, friends, as we study text, that we learn to understand Pshutosha Mikra, which is what is the simple, the clear way of understanding the text? non-Midrashic, non agaritic the way where I read it, I understand it. And I told you, to understand Pshutosha Mikra, I need to see that verse in Debarim. What does it say in Debarim? When you've passed the Jordan, when you've dwelled in the land, and you have respite from all your enemies, and you dwell securely, says the Abar Banel, the Abravanel, David had not fully established his kingdom. He still had battles to fight. He did not yet have true peace in the land. Friends, that's pshat. Why did David not build it? He hadn't reached that level of security yet in the land. Only what happened in the time of Shlomo HaMelech. I'm now going to present to you two midrashic understandings. And understand, there's midrash, and then it's Midrash on Midrash. We're going to learn a Midrash. Or not Midrash. We're going to learn a 
drash, which is I'm going to learn from other psukim, not in Shmuel Aleph, but in Divrei Hayamim. Because there, David tells Shlomo why he cannot build the Bet HaMikdash. There it says, but the word of God was upon me saying, you have shed much blood and you have waged great wars. You shall not build a house in my name because you have shed much blood to the ground before me. So understand, what's the first answer? Because you don't dwell securely. Answer number two, which is given in Divrei Hayamim, which is not written by King David. It was written by Nehemiah centuries late, Ezra and Nehemiah centuries later. What's the answer given? Because David had spilled too much blood. This is what's known as the drash interpretation. What's pshat? Not secure. Drash, David had spilled too much blood. Now I want to give you a midrash on the drash. And I want you to hold on to your seats so you're understanding this midrash. What does it seem to be? The drash is implying there's something wrong with David, that David has spilled too much blood because that's a bad thing. He's been in too many wars because he's a man of war, because he's a man of blood, he cannot build the Bet HaMikdash. Now look at this Midrash, which I'm going to share with you. It's from Yalkut Shimoni. You know what the answer is? You are too pure. Chayecha, says the Midrash, by your life, which means hem lefnei kekorbanot. They, the blood which you spilled, they are before me like sacrifices. Tichtiv, as the Basuk says, ki damim rabim shafachta, for you have spilled much blood, lefnanai. You have spilled much blood before me. What does that mean? The ain lefanai. What does it mean, lefanai? Ela korban. Amor lo. Says David back to, to uh, Hashem. Ve'im ken, lama eni bone oto. If you're saying that the blood which I've spilled is like a korban, then why am I disqualified from building the Bet HaMikdash? Amalo HaKadosh Baruch God says back to him, She'imatabone oto, if you were to build it, Hu kayam ve'eno charav, then it would be established forever and never be destroyed. Well, the Gemara continues. This is great. The Beit HaMikdash would never be destroyed. What, even more of a question why David wasn't allowed to build it if he's so fitting to be the builder. God said to him, It's been revealed to me. I know in the future generations, many years down the line, the Jewish people will sin greatly. And I will cast my anger onto them. What will I do? I will destroy the Beit HaMikdash. They will be punished, but they will be ultimately be saved. Okay? Amar lo HaKadosh Baruch Hu Hayecha. Ho'ir b'chashavta livnoto, af api sheshlomo bin chaboneo. Before we get to that, Hashem says to David, if I would not, if you would build the Bet HaMikdash, I wouldn't be able to destroy it because it would be built on pure chesed, on pure righteousness. And so therefore, I could never destroy it. And therefore, my only resolution would be to destroy the Jewish people. I cannot do that. Therefore, I am going to have it built in Shlomo. Shlomo is going to be great, but Shlomo is not as perfect as you. And so therefore, I will be able to destroy the first Beit HaMikdash rather than, destroying the, rather than destroying the Jewish people. 
And then God says to him, and also, I will consider it to you as if you built it, even though it was Shalomo who built the, the Bet HaMikdash. Because one who is desired to do something, if he is withheld from doing it, it is if he built it. Now understand, this is a Midrash on a Drash, or what I call Midrash on steroids. What is going on here is fascinating to tell me that what is described in Divrei HaYamim as a chisaron, that David cannot build the Beit HaMikdash because he's a man of war, I'm now going to tell you, no, you are the holiest person ever lived. If you built that Beit HaMikdash, it would be great for so long until it became terrible. Why would it become terrible? Because Am Yisrael would not deserve it. And if the Jewish people don't deserve it, then what am I going to have to do? Destroy them rather than destroy it. Rather, if the Beit HaMikdash is almost perfect, I will destroy it, and ultimately, B'nai Yisrael will suffer, but they will not cease to exist. And that is us. That is the history of the Jewish people. We have almost, we have suffered greatly, but we have not ceased to exist. We have died, but we have been born again. We have struggled, but we give birth to life. When we think of Yom HaShoah, Yom HaZikaron, and now Yom HaTzma'ut, we could not have perfection of David, because then we wouldn't have the rebirth. When I read this Midrash, and again, I, you, know, you know me, sometimes I find Midrashim like this on steroids, they're a little bit too hard for me. But this one speaks to me more. It says, you know what? This is exactly what we are. We cannot have perfection in a building, in a human being, because then it's bad. I'd much rather stay in a place which is a little bashed up. Why? So when my kids bash it up, it's not going to be the end of the world. When I bash it up, it won't be the end of the world. The first Beit HaMikdash was almost perfection, but it wasn't mea achuz. It wasn't 100% so that it could be destroyed and we could live on. The second Beit HaMikdash also was a beautiful building, but its merits were not great. And so therefore, it also was destroyed. We went into exile. We have faced terrible, terrible, terrible sacrifices. Pogrom after pogrom, expulsion after expulsion, Shoah, all these terrible, terrible things and calamities. And yet the Jewish people still lives when others, when other uh, nations cease to be recognized. We're still here. Why? I think the answer is this Midrash. Because it will be destroyed, but they will be saved. Hemnit Solin. It's all there. Let's continue. I have always been with you. Says the Mamalez. Can I just ask? Um, yeah. I, I'm, I'm mentally trying to find a place to put it, but can you give us a little bit more info of on Yalkut Shimoni and where like a little bio on him, so I can kind of understand where he's coming from and where he's bringing his information from. Okay, so Yakut is the same. Yakut means a, a collection. Uh, Shimoni, you know what? It's a good question. Uh, give me thirty seconds to look this up. I'm going. I always like to uh, give you a more precision answer than just uh, what I think. Uh, I appreciate it because it's like a very mind blowing thing. So I, I need to put it in context. Uh, in my own head, I'm thinking Yal Kuchimoni is a later collection of Midrashim. I'd probably say, I want to say 7th or 8th century. Like it's pretty late, but I will. Uh, I'm looking it up now. It says. Oh, even later than I thought. It's uh, a tribute. Yakut Shimoni is an anthology of Midrashim on the entire Tanakh, and it's attributed to Rav Shimon Hadashan of Frankfurt on Main in the mid 13th century. 
Okay, it's an extensive and comprehensive collection of literature of the Hachamim, including Talmud, Sifra, Midrash, and all manner of things. Uh, and it was first pr printed in Salonika. So there you go. So although it's a, a, an Ashkenazic rabbi putting it together, it has its uh, Sephardic roots too. So uh, yeah, Rob knew later than that, 12th or 13th century. So I knew Rob was on the money. So it's a later Midrash and it's, it's understood a lot of our, uh, a lot of our trauma as, as a people. But it's also adding a little bit more than that, which is, it's a collection. It's not necessarily new writings. It's a collecting those writings together or putting it through. So it's not necessarily, as I said, there's certain times I can't start writing Midrashim in the 21st century, the same way that he couldn't write Midrashim in the 13th century. Midrash was written in a time period of the Tanaim and Amoraim. It's not really for us to be writing Midrash. So it's a collection which was compiled in the 13th century, but is probably much older. Does that help? Okay, so back to uh, the text. What does it mean I've always been with you? Says the Ma'am Loez, scripture relates four kindnesses that God performed for David. Number one, God did not leave David as an unknown shepherd, but elevated David to captain of the troops and then to the throne itself. Two, God was with him wherever he went. God was protecting him from Shaul and from the Pelishtim. Three, God cut off David's enemies. And four, God made David's name great. And what does it mean like the great ones? And Ma'am Loez says, who are the great ones? Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, or perhaps like Moshe and Aharon. The great ones are not the great non-Jewish kings of the world who have great name and fortune. They're the ones who have great status in my world. The giants, Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, or Moshe and Aharon, or perhaps other Shofetim. A more peaceful time, Rashi says, and I will appoint a place. I yet desire to bring calm in order to offer ease and security for my nation in the days of your son. Here Rashi is hinting at that the pshat is the time has not come for the Bet HaMikdash because you don't dwell securely enough yet. And then what does it say here? Those that will proceed after you, says Rav David Kimchi, from here we learn that Avshalom and Adoniyahu would not be king, for they were already born in Hebron. It was not until Shlomo was born, and Atan told him that he would be the one to build the Bet HaMikdash. Okay, so if David is paying attention here, the one that shall come out from your loins, i.e. has not yet come from your loins. Okay, so all your children so far, they will not build, they will not be king. Who is the king who's going to build the Bet HaMikdash? It's going to be Shalomo. Okay? Then, I, I did something wrong there. Hold on. I lost my... See? It happens even to me. I can have... I like to be tech savvy, and I've had a tech savvy less moment. Savvy less moment. There we go. And I'm back. Uh, the Mamlo says, if you look very carefully in this text, David is actually being told seven things through Nebuah. Seven things were made known to David by God through Natan. Number one, when your days are complete, that's telling David he would live a full 70 years. Number two, you are laid to rest with your fathers means he would not die in battle. Number three, I will establish your seed after you. This son would not usurp the throne from him. Number four, your offspring. This son will not yet be born. Number five, I will secure his kingdom. As soon as he ascends the throne, his kingdom will be established. Did I lose seven there? Number six there? I'm not sure. Seven, I will secure the throne of his kingdom forever. His kingdom will be eternal. So we're seeing here a number of powerful things that David is getting. All these berachot, 
that are happening to him. Then it says that Natan told everything to David. And the Mitsuda there, quoting Abar Banel, says, Natan was not embarrassed to tell David that he had erred in telling him to do all that was in his heart to do. He told him, you know what? I made a mistake and you need to know that. I thought that you were, it was the right time, but I was wrong. It's going to happen later. Now we're going to conclude this chapter by reading the last Sukim. Now imagine your life's long ambition is to build the Bet HaMikdash. And Hashem tells you, very nice compliment, sandwiches going on there, but he still tells you, you're not going to build the Beit HaMikdash. We would expect some disappointment. Instead, we have total hakaratatov, total appreciation from David. Let's have a look at this. But first, I want to tell you that that's important. Hashem let down David gently by giving him berachot and telling him that he will always be with him. But the way that David responds is incredible. It says here in 18, Vayavoha Melech David, and the King David went, Vayeshev Lifnei Hashem, and he sat before Hashem. Now this expression here, he sat before Hashem, is very interesting. We don't normally sit before God, we would expect to stand before God. Before we get into what he says, let's understand this thing of the sitting. Says Rashi, David sat before the Aaron, the Ark. The Radak says, it is forbidden to sit in the temple courtyard. The Talmud derives from this Pasuk that a king from the Davidic line is permitted to do so. So a normal person can't sit, but King David and his descendants can. But there's a dissenting opinion that even a Davidic king cannot sit in the presence of Hashem. So what does Vayeshev mean? Therefore means he set his mind to pray. Okay, don't see it as sitting, but he set his mind, he settled himself in order to pray. Okay, so this is important. He settled his mind to give thanks to God. And he says, Mi Anochi Adonai. Elohim. Who am I? God. Umi beiti, and what is my house? Ki aviotani ad halom, that you have brought me thus far. What do I deserve all this? I am nothing. And my family, my descendants come from nothing, even from questionable lineage. Vatiktan od zot be'enecha Adonai Elohim, vatidabeh gam el beit abdecha lemerachok, as though this was yet too small a thing in your eyes, O Lord God, but you also spoke of your servant's house from afar. Now is this the manner of man, O Lord God? What have you done here? Not only have you you've come and you've addressed to talk about my descendants. What a blessing. And what more can David say to you? For you know your servant, O Lord God. For the sake of your word and according to your own heart, have you brought about all this greatness to make your servant know it. Therefore, you are great, O Lord God, for there is none like you, neither is there any God beside you, according to all that we have heard with our ears. What incredible words from King David, showing utter thanksgiving of all that God has done for him. Says, The Radak, is this fitting for man? Do I deserve all of these things, fitting for great men? I am undeserving of such honor, says Rashi. And what more can David say? What more can I request? You provided me with everything. Next, we see that uh, David shifts his thanksgiving now. He now wants to thank and praise the Jewish people. 
ומי חעמך כי ישראל? גוי אחד בארץ. Think of these words, these are, very, these are the foundation of אתה אחד ושימך אחד ומי חעמך ישראל, that we say in the עמידה for שבת מנחה. Who is like your people, like Israel? One nation in the world. אשר הלכו אלוהים לבדות לו לעם ולשום לו לשם ולעשות לכם הגדולה ונוראות לארצך מפני עמך אשר פדית לך ממצרים גויים ואלוהיו. Who God went to redeem for himself as a people and to make him a name also to accomplish for you the greatness and fearful things for your land in driving out from before your people whom you did redeem for yourself out of Mitzrayim, the nations and their gods. V'atachonen l'cha et amcha Yisrael l'cha la'am ad olam, v'ata Adonai hayita lahem l'Elohim. And you did establish to yourself your people Israel, to be a people to you forever, and you became their god. V'ata Adonai Elohim hadava shedibarta al avdecha, al beito, hakem ad olam, v'aseka shedibarta. And now, O oh God, the word that you have spoken concerning your serving, concerning his house, confirm it forever and do as you have spoken. V'yigdal shimcha ad olam leemo Adonai tzevaot Elohim, al Yisrael uveit avdecha David yeh nachon lefanecha. And let your name be magnified forever, that it may be said, the Lord of hosts is God over Israel, and the house of your servant David shall be established before you. Ki ata Adonai tzevaot alei Yisrael. Galita! את אוזן עבדך לאמור, בית אבנה לך, על כן מצא עבדך את ליבו להתפלל אליך את התפילה הזאת. For you, O Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, have revealed to your servants here, saying, a house I will build you. Therefore, has your servant found in his heart to pray to you this prayer. ואתה אדוני אלוהים, אתה הוא אלוהים, ודבריך יהיו אמת, ותדבר אל עבדך את הטובה הזאת. And now, O Lord God, you alone are God, and your words are truth, and you have spoken unto your servant this good thing. And now let it please you to bless the house of your servant, that it may continue forever before you. For you, O Lord God, have spoken it, and through your blessing, let me bless the house of your servant forever. Now, I shouldn't be blown away or surprised by these words, because this is, of course, David HaMelech, who wrote Tehillim, who wrote the book of Psalms. But I am. He is so poetic. His language, his love of God, his so much hakar tatov and his appreciation, it blows me away. This is how we thank God. This is how we show our love and appreciation. It says Mamloes, who is like Israel, David begins to praise the people of Israel in whose merit he was anointed king. David understands that the eternalness of his kingdom is dependent upon their eternalness as a nation. David likens the kindness that God has shown him to the kindness that God has done to the Jewish people by redeeming them from Egypt and exalting them above the other nations. You cannot have a king without a people. You cannot have a people without a God. David, Hashem, the Jewish people, were all interconnected. This is the Beit David, the house of David that we're talking about. This is Mashiach that we're talking about. Bring Mashiach ben David. That's what we're missing. We have Hashem, we have the Jewish people, we have the land. All we're missing is Mashiach Tzidkenu. Bimhera B'yamin, it should come speedily in our days. And as we celebrate Yom HaTzma'ut, and we read about David's yearning for the Beit HaMikdash, that we should yearn, that we should pray for these things, and they should come about in our lifetime. Amen, can you hear it, son?